It's a real art form to kind of learn to receive our experience. You know, our tendency is to um, sort of, we're kind of expressive, right? Like, there's like thoughts and ideas and agendas and it's sort of, I just feel like the energy is kind of, you know, like I'm expressing. And this is kind of like, I don't know, <laughs> making up words here, but impressing. You know, and you're like impressed. <laughs> and so it's like, it's like, it's like really receiving and listening to whatever is happening. And it's, it's really, I, I, it really is an art form because there's so many subtle and not so subtle ways where You know where we where we are trying to manipulate and control the experience. I mean, this is like um, <laughs> you know all the ways your partner has told you about how you can be a better listener. Yeah, no, <laughs> is it just me? Um, or you've heard ways like you, you, so. This is learning to be a better listener with your own self. It's one thing when you're listening to a friend or a lover or whoever. And you're like, oh, yeah, I really care about them, really listening. But if you notice, like, we're usually not nearly as good at listening to our own self. Like, once I tune in, it's like, well, hey, I, I got a lot to tell me. Right? And so to really receive the experience, um, it, 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 it takes a certain cultivation it's like uh, it's kind of like learning to ride a bike or something. It's a, it's one of these things that you you can't kind of make yourself do it. Just like you know, you can't just I mean, if you before you knew how to ride a bike, you can't just will yourself to be able to ride a bike. It's actually a pretty good analogy in that, in the same way that it's mysterious. You know, when you're learning to ride a bike, like you can't and you keep falling over, and then at some point something clicks. And you, you just can. And if, you know, if we were learning to ride a bike together, like say we were both kids and we we're like learning to ride, and we both can't do it and suddenly you got it, like something clicked and you're like, I'm doing it. And if I was like, dude, what are you doing different? Like a second ago, like you couldn't do it and now you're doing it. What are you doing different? I mean, you couldn't answer that, could you? Right? You're like, I, you wouldn't, like, I don't know what I'm doing different. I mean, it's just suddenly I got it. Something clicked, and I and I don't know. It's just happening. So it's sort of like that, actually. That's a that's a pretty good analogy, if I do say so myself. <laughs> um, and that when the more you mess with it, the more you kind of try to make that happen, you always get in the way even more. Because it just becomes like another agenda, like, you know, I gotta go, I wanna, I wanna get that thing. But you just keep receiving it. And what's amazing is that you can, um, you can actually receive just about any part of your experience. Like you can, you can um, see it. You can, anything in your experience can be, can be seen can be known, right? So you could be sitting there, and you're like, oh, this sucks. Oh, I hate this. Oh, man, this is terrible. And you're like, oh, OK, cool, check that out, like frustration. Oh, OK, like this is the experience of frustration. Cool. Like you can know that. And then, you, and then maybe, oh, that's pretty good. See, I got it. And you're like, oh, look, pride. Cool. Check that out. I got pride going. And, um, and so anything, any part of the experience is just something else to be seen. Um, 
what happens is we get distracted by there's this point of view that kind of hooks us and sells us this idea that some experiences are better than others, that you should be having these, and, you, and these aren't so good. And usually one of the reasons we get baited or hooked by them is that it, it usually has a certain kind of, um, I don't know, call it a narcissistic kind of spin, where it's like, well, these are good experiences, and not only are, are they good, but they say something good about you. Like, this is good. Over here, th you're a good person, you're a good Buddhist, your practice is really doing well. And then these experiences, like, oh, you're not so good. All that meditation is not really doing anything. Like you've been meditating. Look at all this anger you've got. Are you familiar with that? These are maybe, are these just my voices? <laughs> but um, so it makes it hard to actually just receive it in this equanimous, neutral way because there's all this investment of like, oh, these are good. These aren't so good. But you can actually just, when you see that, you can receive that. You're like, oh, yeah, check it out, judgment. Like, oh, yeah, this is that thing he was talking about. Look, I totally have this thing where my mind is telling me these are good and these aren't good. And then once you know that, it's just another phenomenon. It's just another phenomenon arising. And that way you can sit there and you, you can watch anything. You could watch murderous rage. You could work, You could watch, you know, lust. You can watch. I mean, also good ones, you know, joy and peace and whatever. But it's just stuff. It's just this human experience happening. And when when we can get used to this thing of receiving, the reason it's so liberating. It's because then you don't have to do anything about any of that. You're actually free to just exist because all that stuff isn't a problem. Now, there's usually some confusion at this point. Um, and I want to be clear that when I'm talking like this, I'm being very specific about the meditation period itself. It's, it's good to clear that up because, you know, then it sounds like when people say, oh, so I should just accept everything in my life all the time, and, but what about, you know, this situation or that situation? It's a little more complicated once we get out into the world and we're dealing with life, which is why I think of these meditation periods in a way as like, it's like, it's like lab, laboratory conditions. It's like, hey, I'm just going to sit here and I'm not doing anything. I'm not even moving. So this is a great time to practice this kind of rec receiving, or re this kind of receptive, kind of absorbing the experience. It's such a grueling full-time job to have to manipulate our experience, to have to manage it. Like, actually, when we first started, I had this moment when we kind of sank into it a little bit, and there was just a lot going on. And I had this feeling, it was like, oh, my God, there's so much going on. And there was this feeling like, oh, shit, that's kind of a problem. Like, I got to do that. I got to deal with so much. And then as it settled, I saw that, just that idea is just an idea. I was like, oh, right, there is, there's that feeling and that voice. And it's kind of a thought slash feeling of like, oh, that's all my responsibility. I have to do something about it. And then when, once I see that, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's that guy that always says it's my responsibility. I don't, he's just wrong. <laughs> and... Um, and it's like, oh, yeah, this stuff is not my problem. I, I say this quote here a lot because I like it. One of my teachers used to say, it's like the phone's ringing, but you know it's not for you. And that feeling, <laughs> I don't know, I like that. You know when you're somebody else's house and the phone's ringing, you're like, not my problem. So it's, it, that, that analogy, what I like about it is it captures this 
both sides that you're fully aware of it. Like, you can hear the phone ringing. It's not like, wow, all my thoughts have gone away. Like, there's nothing going on. It's like, no, no, stuff's happening. I can hear it. I can, there's thoughts and feelings and all kinds of stuff. And so it's like you're at somebody's house, and you're like, yeah, I can hear the phone's ringing. I'm not deaf. But I'm not relating to it like it's a problem for me or something I have to do something about. And so sometimes it can feel like, oh, well, I'll check it out. It's a bunch of emotions. That's cool. And even what's amazing is when you can... Um, When you can feel the difficulties or the fears or the, these kind of challenging experiences and just notice that it is challenging and just have that as the experience that's being seen. Like when I think I mentioned that at one point, like if you're being with something difficult. How, how just beautifully human is that? Like, isn't that amazing as human beings? We could sit like this and, and actually maybe dealing with something quite difficult. Like really touching into something, you know, painful or scary or uncomfortable. And it's not a bad thing. It's part of the beauty of this human experience is... Um, you know, we're not just machines. We're not just robots. And um, sometimes our experience is difficult. And to just feel that with this kind of reverence and a kind of um, sort of humility and kind of be touched by that, like, I've actually been telling you that's something that's fascinated me a lot when something's difficult. I'm like, wow, this is difficult. And it's a trip, because it's like, what does that really mean? You know, it's not like someone's like, asking you to like, lift heavy objects. You know what I mean? Like someone's like, lift that big boulder. You're like, that is difficult. It's like, OK, that makes sense. But when you're sitting with something, and you're like, wow, this is like emotion, but it's difficult. It's difficult to be with. Isn't that, it's kind of amazing, right? What I've, I mean, for me personally, what I've, because I've, I've, I've explored that, this question, like, what does difficult mean? I'm actually be curious to hear what you guys, how you experience it. But for me, I find that it's basically, it's that the experience is overwhelming. It's like I can't quite, it, it starts to overwhelm the, the, this presence of me who's being with it. And now the experience is getting so strong that the me who is watching it is getting, um, is getting overwhelmed. It's kind of drowning in it. Is that, how is that for you? Is, like so curious. What? What? How is? How do you experience difficulty? Yeah. Well, when you were talking, I was struck by. Okay, when I'm dealing with something difficult on the cushion, is it that it's something that's really inherently difficult for me, or is it difficult for me to sit with it? Because the stuff that I find difficult in my life that a, a lot of times I would benefit by not doing anything about it. Because usually the stuff that I find really difficult, I'm really attached to, and I gotta do something about it, I gotta fix it, I gotta do this or that. And a lot of times my best efforts just fuck shit up. And so I'd be better off if I could sit and with it quietly without I've got to do something about this I've got to do something about this but that's that's the thing is that 
Oh, oftentimes I can't sit with it quietly. And I, I'm constantly, okay, I'm sitting here. Man, what am I going to do about this thing that I've got to do, that I, that I feel this urge to just, I can't sit with it. i got to do something about mm -hmm. it. And, and so there's that, you know, I have a difficult time telling the difference between things that are actually inherently difficult or things that are just difficult for me to be patient about. Yeah. I feel like it comes down to that it's emotionally or even energetically un uncomfortable. And I want to alleviate that by doing something about it. And, uh, you know. And, you know, most of you know that I, 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 uh, I'm, I've been studying and actually got certified in the somatic experiencing work. And their whole thing is, um, go ahead. <laughs> what? Um, their thing is um, kind of the crux of their, their whole system is they really watch for... Um, we have these two nervous system models where it's, there's a, they call it the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. So the sympathetic is the kind of arousal um, system. And then as it gets more, as it goes, you know, if, it's, if you're full on threat and you go into what they call fight, flight, or freeze. So it's just biological. Like if you're threatened, these defenses come up and you're ready to fight, flight, or freeze. Freeze is just that state where like and if, when an animal knows that they're going to get eaten, they just kind of go limp. Conversely, the parasympathetic is what they call like the <coughs> rest and digest. It's, it's where you rest, it's where you, you know, reproduce, if that's your thing. <laughs> um, uh, it's when, where stuff heals, but it's like, like that's where you're open. And it's not that like one's good and one's bad, I and mean, you need them both, depending on what's, what's happening. But what I've found amazing as I've watched this with, like, with a magnifying glass is that w it's possible that we're often threatened by our experience. But think about this for a second. Is that, you know what I mean? So you're sitting there and you're having some experience and it's actually kind of a threat to you. And there's a kind of defensiveness that comes up like, oh, oh, not that. Oh, I hate that feeling. Or like, oh, that, oh, that whole thing. That, oh, that, there, I got a lot of shame around that. Or this, you know, a lot of times it, 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 we especially don't like it when it contradicts our self-image. Like, I like to see myself as this kind of person, and this experience really doesn't jive with that. And so it's threatening to me. And it actually, what I notice is that it, it can stimulate this fight-flight response. And you get quite activated just sitting there if what's coming up is, is threatening. So I found it to be very useful to know that and to see that and then to actually have compassion for it. Be like, oh, whoa, check it out, I'm, I'm threatened right now. And I gotta say, if you wanna save yourself 10, 20 years, based on my experience, um, which I would love for that to happen, if for no other reason, <laughs> if I can just save you 10 or 20 years, if you learn from my mistakes, um, unfortunately for many years when I would have that kind of experience, I didn't realize it, but I would respond to that quite badly. I would, I would go like, oh I'm, oh, I'm threatened by this experience. And then just all this very sophisticated Buddhist judgment would come in about like, oh, that's so stupid. You're threatened by your experience. And oh, see, you're so attached to your self-image. And this thing threatens it. And you see, you, you, you haven't evolved at all. And look how attached you are. And oh, you're caught in this and you're caught in that. 
So unhelpful in that moment. <laughs> I gotta tell you, that litany of thoughts in that very threatened moment, you're like, hey, I'm already feeling threatened, and now, <laughs> and now I'm actually being judged a lot for it. But this felt, it's, it's funny, because for me it felt like I was being a good Buddhist or something. I had some idea that like, no, I'm being really strict with myself. And, um, not a good idea. One of the reasons it's not a good idea is it does nothing to deactivate that response. Right? Like, again, for my physiological system, that's just more threats. Right? That's just going to make me, my guard go up even more. So part of this practice, to look at it from this SE lens, the somatic experiencing lens, or this phys just being conscious of our physiology, part of this practice is how do we, for the meditation time, hold the experience in such a way that we keep leaning into the deactivation. And that we, we see these, these activation triggers. And as we get to know them better and better, we can kind of lean, lean out of it. So in that moment, for example, like the moment you have compassion for the way you're receiving that, right? You're like, whoa, I just got yelled at. I used to have this girlfriend, she had this great line. She would say something sometimes, and then, and then she would like say something judgmental about herself. And she would suddenly go, whoa. I just hurt my own feelings. <laughs> and it was great to watch. It was like always touching. I'd see that like, oh yeah, that was, that was pretty harsh. <laughs> so, you know, it's funny. When I would hear stuff like that years ago, I, I, I kind of didn't like it because it would it'd strike me as very kind of touchy-feely and kind of very you know, very Bay Area. It's just like, oh, I gotta be kind. Like, oh yeah, I don't wanna hurt my own feelings. I gotta, but, um, but what I have found over the years is like, well, no, it's not, it's not just that. It's that, it's, um, we're navigating or like we're learning how to deactivate um, this, the nervous system. And so the whole thing about being nice to yourself or compassionate and kind and all of that inside, it's like, well, it's actually crucial for meditation because you can't actually meditate in a fight or flight response. Like, that's not, that's not happening. And everything, I mean, like the physiology is all wrong. It's not just like, oh, it's, the, it's like literally the way, what is happening physiologically in your body is not conducive to meditating. The, the kind of letting go of the self and experience, or experiencing yourself as one with everything, that ain't happening in fight or flight. Fight or flight is the opposite, right? Fight or flight is like, no, no I'm really separate and everything's a threat to me. So I am, I am, it's me against, you know, the bad guys. So I do find that there's a, I mean, depending on what's going on, but sometimes actually um, a little supportive inner dialogue can be useful. Meaning like if something's coming up, sometimes I will actually say to myself, like if, it's, if, it, if I'm watching it get activated, I will, I will talk, I think of myself like, well, if I was with a little kid and I wanted to calm the kid down, what, how would I do it? And um, so a lot of times it's just a little comment like, hey, that's okay. Like, this is all right. It's just an emotion. No big deal. It can be helpful. Um, and the kindness, the inherent kindness in that is very disarming. I think of this sometimes as like couples therapy for yourself. <laughs> it's like couples therapy for like me and I. <laughs> Like the me and the I. And they don't get along so well. Sometimes they don't listen to each other very well.
So it's very important that this awareness that we're cultivating is a kind awareness. Because if you look closely, there's lots of different kinds of awareness, different types of awareness. You can have awareness that's pretty aware, but it's very critical. And that, and that, so like mindfulness in the wrong hands, <laughs> you know, like when your inner critic gets a hold of mindfulness, it's, it's kind of a bad combo because it's like, right, my inner critic is armed with mindfulness now, shit. Like I'm really aware of everything that's wrong with me. I'm really present to just how fucked up I am. So that's no good. <laughs> um, so we want to cultivate this awareness that's kind. And, um, and sometimes it's actually, if that's something that's hard to, like if you don't know that flavor, it can actually be very helpful to, uh, to even think of somebody that emulates that for you. Like some people will think of the Dalai Lama, for example. They feel like he has this, they think of him and they're like, oh yeah, he's got that kindness. Um, for me, for years, I actually would use my grandmother. My grandmother was very kind, um, as opposed to my parents. <laughs> um, and so I would imagine, I would kind of tune into her vibe. I'd be like, how would, like, so I'm watching myself, but, like, with the tone that my grandmother used to watch me with. Because it was kind. It was like, yeah, she was attentive, but, you know, not, like, meddling and not overly, could just kind of, you know, that grandmotherly vibe, if you... We're lucky to have that. Is that, is this all making sense? Yeah? Yeah, please. Exactly. Um, and that's the feeling of being activated. And that the difficulty is actually coming from <coughs> touching into things that you are aware of or kind of like a lot deeper, maybe. You know, and that's like the difficulty. Say that last part again. Just the last part. That the, the discomfort kind of comes in when there's an awareness around something that is uncomfortable because you are finally sitting with something that you are not normally looking at. Yeah. And that that's the difficult part. Definitely. Um, is that you know that there's like more there, you know? That you're just start starting to kind of skim the surface. And that like that's the difficulty. Because you're like, whoa, okay. We're finally starting to get into the hard stuff. And this is the stuff that I'm usually trying to avoid. Yeah. And that that's like, that's when you get activated, you know? It can be. I mean, that's definitely one. I mean, that's what's happening for you. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. so that's, that's what matters. Is, I mean, that's, it, it, I, mean I, I think you're right, but it doesn't even matter kind of, you know, theoretically. Mm -hmm. it's just, that's what's happening for you, I mean, I, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, what, what can be helpful is just to see that, you know, that's a story. Like, you don't, you don't know. Like you don't, I mean, maybe there's more, maybe there isn't, or maybe, I mean, you don't know what it'll be like. And actually, a lot of this activation is very much based on kind of associations and stories and assumptions. You know, and, and there are a lot of things we have avoided, so when you finally sit down, it's like, oh, there it is. But the idea of what it will be like to be with that is a story. And what I find time and time again is when you actually turn towards it and you are with it, 
it is not that bad. It's not, it's like not, I'll say it's not the way I thought it would be. And the, um, <laughs> there's a lot, it's funny, this analogy is coming up for me of, um, like I have, I have a cat and she hates the carrier. Like if I pull out the carrier, she you know, runs away and I have to like shove her in there and she's like trying to pop out. I'm like, <laughs> but what's interesting is, <laughs> hey, I got to take her places. What you do? Um, but what's interesting about it is uh, she can't, the association, it just, it triggers her, right? So she goes into fight or flight, like, oh, that thing, I don't want to go in there. But she can't handle like the complexity of like, yeah, but you know, we go to lots of different places. I don't just carry my cat around. <laughs> I went somewhere a few weeks ago and I, and I had to take her to my mom's. That's why this is coming up. I'm not like walking around with my cat. Or my cat. Um, but so, you know, she's like, ooh, carrier, like, I don't know, like sometimes we go to the vet or sometimes, we, you know, I took her to my mom's. But then on the way back, it's like, yo, we're going home. Like when, we were, when I was coming back from this trip, I went to my mom's to pick her up. And I'm like, we're going in the carrier because you're getting to go home and you want to go home. This is really good news. But she's like, nah, it's the carrier. I don't fuck with the carrier. Like, that's it, you know? And she can't handle that. Like, hey, you don't know how this is going to go. Like, you might be in the carrier for just a little while. And maybe on the other end of this is you get to go home. So my point is that it's like, it's that kind of association. So a lot of times, you know, it's like we're the same way. We feel something. We're like, oh, that's that thing. I'm uh, going, not going there. It's like, no, no, that's taking you home. That's taking you home. I know it, I mean, I know it looks scary, but that's, that's a very deep, profound thing that's about to happen. Like, you're about to uh, come in deep contact with yourself. On the other side of that is uh, liberation. You know, on the other side of that is, um, this is this thing that's like this barrier and, and actually as you face it, you're getting to go home with yourself. You're getting actually to be with yourself. So it's actually really good news. recognizing that that is a, something that actually happened mm -hmm. and like sort of massaging that past experience and with nice words and saying like that's cool that happened doesn't yeah. mean it's going to blow you over yeah it's nice I, li I like what you're saying because um, it's nice to bring in the compassionate moment of saying, hey, I get it. I understand why you're scared. Because this is what I was saying, like, um, the, the 20 or so years I'm trying to save you, is, is this idea of, like, no, you shouldn't be scared. And what can be really um, problematic is that we can be smart enough intellectually 
like the part of us that's not that affected by the body, where it's just like thought. And in thought, we can theoretically say like, oh, I get it, I shouldn't even be scared of that, that's silly. I know better than that. It's like, yeah, but your animal body doesn't. You know what I mean? This is the part we, I think, like, actually, this is like, I think, a real plight of modern humanity is that, like, we've gotten so smart that we have um, really started to uh, disregard the physiology. So you could be like, oh, I shouldn't be scared of that. It's like, yeah, your whole physiology doesn't know that. And the reality is you're scared. And it's like, whatever button got pushed, you're in fight or flight, like, it's just happening. Um, and so, having compassion for that is very helpful. And again, the thing that I'm, the, 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 the moment, I think, where I'm, like, I'm trying to save you that time, is that in those moments where I would say, oh, that's silly, you shouldn't be scared of that, or oh, like, that's so attached, you know better than that, or blah, blah, blah. Like, that's actually super violent and super uh, aggressive and, and, uh, and not kind at all. I mean, it's very rejecting of the experience, right? I mean, it's kind of ironic, it's like, oh, I'm cultivating, I'm practicing being present, but not with that. It's like, I want to be present, but that's all wrong. I'm not going to be present with that. Oh, fear, I shouldn't even be having that. So this, the, what you're, I like how you're saying that, because then you're like, oh, I, yeah, I'm scared. Like, this is, yeah, this is freaking me out. And let, maybe I can reflect and say, oh, yeah, this isn't necessarily that way. I want to, in the remainder, we don't have much time left, I want to actually give you a couple of, uh, or at least one nice tool, like a very technical trick to use at times like this. And what it is, it's pretty simple. If, if the experience starts being overwhelming, you don't want to just keep sitting with it. The whole like just be with it is cool until it's not. I mean, there's like a threshold where you're like, look, I'm not really being with it. I'm sitting here just spinning now. And just because I'm disciplined enough to not move, I'm not really being with it. And you can feel it like, am I, um, you know, like, I don't know, another analogy would be like, you know how we even say like digesting your experience or metabolizing your experience? These are nice Bay Area words. Um, it's like, so it's like food, right? Like if you have a meal and you're being with it. You're like, yeah, no, I'm eating this, this is nourishing me, I'm digesting it. Compared to like, I don't know, drowning in it. Like, imagine, I don't know, the room is now filled up with soup and you're like, you're, you're drowning in it. It's like, yeah, it's not nourishing anymore, you're not metabolizing jack shit, you're drowning. In it. <laughs> it's like way too much, you can't handle it, you're drowning, that's it. So when you notice that that's happening, it's important to actually be honest with that and not to try to like, like macho your way through it. Another thing I spent, wasted 20 years doing. Because um, it's not actually helpful. It's not deactivating your system and all of that. So one really cool little trick. I'll give you two. How much time we got? It's two and a half minutes per trick. Um, The, the, the lesser powerful, like for a slightly lesser extreme situation, is actually shift your focus to something pleasant in your experience. And if you're wondering like, yeah, but in the beginning you said there's no right or wrong and it's just like everything's everything. Um, you're still not trying to create an experience, but you scan your experience for something that's even slightly pleasurable. So just, let's just try it. We got two and a half minutes. So, uh, I mean, you don't even have to move. You don't, you don't have to move. Just, as you sense your body, just notice if there's anything that's kind of nice. And it, you know, it doesn't have to be like spectacularly nice. But maybe just, I don't know, the, the chair against your back or 
Maybe you like how a piece of clothing feels on your body. I don't know. I mean, whatever. It could be very, very small. But focusing your awareness on something that's inherently pleasurable will really help deactivate your system. Because the problem is, is that it, it tends to uh, kind of snowball, that once you feel threatened, your system now scans for more threats. Again, this is total just physiology. Right? Like if your system, again, this animal, biological, reptilian brain system, feels threatened, it's not naturally going to go, it's like, oh, someone's trying to eat me, but hey, look at that sunset. It's like, no, man, I'm looking for threats, I'm, you know, I'm on high alert now. And so what will happen is your system will start scanning, just unconsciously, your experience for other problems, other things that, that are seen as threats. Additionally, shift to something pleasant. And if you can really stay with it and just let yourself enjoy it, and, and then, the, you know, if you're threatened enough to bring like, oh, but you can't do that, come on, there's all this crazy stuff. It's like, no, 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 I'm not. I'm just going to stay with this. And this is what I mean by the laboratory environment of the meditation session. It's because out in the world, it might be trickier. Like, hey, maybe it is kind of threatening. Who knows? I mean, we can't speak to that. But in a meditation session, I mean, some part of you knows, like, nothing's going to happen. I mean, no one's actually going to jump you, like, while you're, while you're sitting. <laughs> yeah? I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> um, so that, like focusing on pleasure, I mean, it just, it works. It, it just changes the system. It, like, it's a way to kind of shift it where the system's like, oh, okay, pleasure, and it starts to unwind. So that, that's a good one. And actually, this, the, the Buddha talks about this a lot. It's not, I'm not just making this up. He, I got to every so often throw in kind of a Buddhist quote to make it legit. Um, but he says, I mean, there's actually lots of sutras where he says, abandon the unpleasant and focus on the pleasant. <clears throat> the Buddha was big on pleasure, on meditative pleasure. People don't realize that because it's a very austere kind of tradition, but that's, that's about worldly pleasure, like sense pleasure. Meditative pleasure, he was all about that. I mean, he actually said it's very necessary. Because it's that meditative pleasure that will unwind that nervous system more and more and more and more. And actually the, the relinquishing of and the, and the um, renunciation of chasing after all these things that we think are going to make us happy really only comes once your system <coughs> discovers something better. It's not just a bunch of discipline. You're like, no, you must not eat ice cream. And you're like, oh, this sucks. <laughs> It's like, nah, like I have found something that's much deeper and much more pleasurable in a very direct, real way. And my system likes it and feels very gratified by it, very satisfied by it. So then ice cream just doesn't sound so tempting or whatever. You know, you're like, that thing? Like, man, I got, I got meditative pleasure. So I, that's real. That's a real thing. I mean, we don't talk about it as much. And it was very important. Once I found out about that, I was like, oh, this actually ultimately is supposed to uh, feel pretty good. <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> Did anyone tell you? Because <laughs> you can go for 20 years with it not feeling, <laughs> not feeling so good. <laughs> Um, do you really want to know the second one? Because we're out of time. <laughs> okay, real quick. Uh, in more extreme situations, if you find yourself like really bugging out and like it's, you're just really overwhelmed and you can't find pleasure, you're freaked out, open your eyes. Just stop. Stop with the meditation. Sit there, open your eyes, and let yourself... You, let's try it right now real quick. Just look around the room. But in this way where you just let your eyes kind of wander around. Um, 
Like this way where you're not controlling them. You're not like looking for something, but you're just kind of letting them, you know, if you just let your eyes do their own thing, you stop controlling them. They like to look at stuff. Their eyes, that's what they do. And notice like they just kind of look around and, I don't know, like it just kind of, you think, oh, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, that's kind of cool. And as you do that, as you, or like, I'd like to say, when, as you allow that to just happen, are you doing it, Jay? <laughs> There's going to be a test later. <laughs> um, you might find that your eyes actually come to rest on something that you like, that, that somehow there's something pleasant about it. Now, it doesn't mean you necessarily like the object. You might just be like, oh, yeah, yeah, the way the light is falling on that, or eh, it's kind of cool, just like the line or the shape or the texture of it. I mean, it can be very abstract. But once they kind of arrive at something that's kind of enjoyable in some ways, let yourself stay there and let yourself feel that pleasantness, like the inherent kind of pleasantness of that, whatever, the shape, the light, the object. And, um, and this, this, that, that technique is called reorienting. It actually pulls us out of that spin and brings us back into the room. Because once you're spinning like that, you know, it's a story. I mean, you're not even in the room anymore. You're like, it's like PTSD at this point. So this is a way to come back to very much this physical reality, just really here. And if you do that for a while, you can see about going back and, you know, like trying again. But I would not, I would, it's not that helpful to traumatize yourself with meditation. Just saying. So don't, uh, don't force yourself to sit with like really difficult stuff. Like it's got to be reasonable. And I'm telling you, you're better off if it's starting to get too to be too much to stop and take a break and not overwhelm yourself and come back like later or whatever than to force yourself through it. And this is where wisdom and experience comes in. Like where is that line? You know, experience will let you know. And, and there's just, and there's no way, you just got to, no, I'll, I'll leave you with a little Zen, oh, great, well, I'll leave you with a little Zen story. This teacher, this master and a student are walking together, and something happens, I don't even remember what, but something happens, and the master, like, just deals with it really well, just like, ba-bam. And the, and the student's really impressed, and he's like, wow, master, that was incredible. How did, how did you know how to do that? And the master says, good judgment. And the student says, wow, well, how, how do you get good judgment? And the master says, bad judgment. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is trial and error, you know? You, you, you feel it out. This is, you're going to be meditating for years. You're going to like log in thousands of hours. Whatever, a couple of meditations one way or the other, it's fine. So, you know, you, maybe you'll take it too far, and then you're like, oh, yeah, you know, that was kind of too far. Um, and then you, you, so you find where that edge is. There's kind of, this is actually what in some ways you could think of as the middle, the middle path. This is great, I'm tying in the Buddhist themes. Um, the middle path, because the middle path is that, you know, you know what the Buddha said? You know about the, the, flu, the lute? The, so after he tried to practice too hard, he, uh, he heard this lute teacher talking to a student, and he said, you know, the, um, it's called the simile of the lute. So he said the string has to be, if it's too tight, it'll snap. If it's too loose, it won't play, right? It's just slack. But there's a sweet spot in the middle where it actually sounds beautiful. So it's just enough tension, but not too much tension. And so it's the same thing with practice. Um, if it's too hard, if you're just like forcing yourself to stay with all these difficult, tra traumatic things, it's too much. You can't handle it. You're just getting activated. It's, it's not, that's like the, you know, the string snapping. Like you can't maintain presence. Um, 
On the flip side, you know, if you're just not even really sitting and you're just kind of all over the place and, hey, everything's everything, I'm not trying to manipulate my experience at all, it's cool. You're like, no, you're just lost now. You're just not, you're just, <laughs> come on. <laughs> so the sweet spot is, you know, it's kind of where we learn anything. It's like where it's just challenging enough that, you know, it's challenging where you're learning stuff, but um, not so challenging that it's really just impossible. And that's quite literally what the middle path means. I mean, that, that is what, um, what the Buddha meant by the middle path. So I apologize. We've gone way over it. Thanks. Sorry to keep you. Um, so we should end now. <laughs> um, announcements? Thanks. Hey, guys. Um, just a couple quick announcements. We have, starting tomorrow, a class series for four weeks with Eve Ekman on um, cultivating a, emotional balance. So this is actually, it ties in with your talk really nicely. What's up? Um, so there's some flyers on the front desk about that. It's going to be a really cool class. I've looked at some of the materials before, and it just looks really, really interesting. Um, if you're into working with emotion in your practice and also feel like learning, too, just about the psychology behind human emotion, um, it should be really, really interesting and really informative. She's a really, really good teacher. Yeah, she's, she's kind of a badass. Um, we've got great retreats coming up and all kinds of classes and day longs. Uh, many of the flyers are out there. And um, also just a Reminder that this center is um, running entirely on the generosity of all of the people who walk through our doors. Um, the crazy thing about the tradition that we're practicing in is that for the last 2,600 years, it's been moved forward, thanks, entirely by generosity. Um, there aren't that many things in this world that actually just because people care about it and want to continue to support it. Um, and this is part of that, and you are part of that. Um, you are, by being here, by making a donation in the Donna Basket, um, you're supporting our teachers, you're supporting this center, and you are a part of this um, long lineage of practitioners. So thank you for being a part of that. Thank you for keeping us afloat. Thank you. So just to finish, I, I apologize for uh, running long. Just we do this little ritual at the end. Just bring your awareness back to your body. Just sense, sense how it is now. See if you can just receive the experience. Sort of let the experience just happen. May the merit generated by us coming together like this as a sangha, as a community, coming together to support each other's practice, hearing these teachings and applying them to our moment-to-moment -moment daily experience, seeing that it's not, uh, these aren't like highfalutin fancy teachings, but, but actually apply right here in this moment, just to this very normal, simple human experience. <clears throat> we dedicate and share this merit with beings everywhere. May we all be free. Thank you very much. <laughs>